Rise and shine, it's Espresso time. Good morning, Believe Nation, it's Evan. My one word is believe and I believe in you. I believe you have an amazing gift inside you that I wanna see explode out onto the world. So grab your coffee and sip on today's message, hustle. Over to you, Jordan Belfort. I wake up every morning. Espresso, keep me going. I wake up every morning. I was a born entrepreneur. Sometimes I exited my mother's womb. When I was eight years old, I was delivering papers door to door, knocking on doors, expanding a paper route. When I was 12 years old, I was shoveling driveways after snowstorms in New York. Yep. Make 20 bucks a driveway after a big snowstorm. Uh, I hit it big for the first time when I was 16, selling ices on the beach, blanket to blanket to blanket. Wow. And I, by, that's how it started. And after that, I was hiring people to come work. I had, little, I had 12 year old kids selling puka shell necklaces for me. My mother was buttering bagels in the morning. And that was really the way I always was, was you know, moving towards life. Looking At for 16. The, yeah, I was just, you know, always wanted to make money. Hustle does not guarantee your success, but it's your ticket to the show. You cannot win without hustling. Again, it doesn't mean that you will win just because you're working hard but you will never win without having the hustle. And that applies to every area of your life and your business. If you wanna win in entrepreneurship, you have to work really hard. You have to work smart and you have to work hard because if you don't, you'll get crushed by the people who are working smart and hard. If you wanna win as a husband or as a wife, you have to work hard in your relationship. If you wanna win as a father or a mother, you have to be there for your child and work hard on that relationship. Wherever you are spending your time and really dedicating yourself to, that's the area that is going to grow. And so even looking at whatever important projects you have, whatever you say your ambitions are, whatever you say your big goals are, does that map to what you're actually doing? Look at your schedule. Does your schedule, does your daily activities map to your ambition? The things that you are doing on a daily basis, if you keep doing those things, will it lead to the goals that you have for yourself? And for a lot of people, they don't. You're doing stuff and only a small percentage of it actually relates to you accomplishing that big goal, that big dream of yours. And so it's a matter of shifting that perspective. It's a matter of changing your schedule so that where you are working, will lead to you accomplishing your goals. So you start with the goals, where you wanna go, and then map it back to your weekly calendar, Monday to Friday or Saturday, Sunday, for business, for relationships, other stuff as well. Map everything out. Your personal time, your business time, does the activities in your calendar, if you keep doing those things every single week, will it lead to you accomplishing those big goals that you have for yourself? I'm also a big believer that when you are working hard on your goals, you can pass people who've been doing this for years or decades sometimes, just because you were putting in the hustle where they aren't. Quick example, a couple years into my speaking career, I connected with an agency in New York and they didn't want to take me on. These are the guys who deal with people from CNN and big news networks and big thought leaders and they help turn those people into, into celebrities, into thought leaders, into being able to have products, into getting their brand and their name out there. And I thought, this is really cool, like an agent for a thought leader. That's really cool, I wanna explore this. When I first had my call with them, they said, you're not good enough as a speaker for us to work with you. And that really hurt, because they'd already been speaking for a couple of years, but compared to who they were working with, I wasn't good enough. I didn't pass the line yet. I didn't meet the minimum standard but they love my message of believe. They love what I stood for. This is where, when you figure out your one word, it can get you into doors because people feel your passion connection even when you don't have the skills or resources to be there. It allows you to play a bigger game even though you shouldn't be there, right? And so they love my message of believe. I said, okay, we're gonna take a flyer on you. And so my agent gave me my first assignment and that was to tell my foundation story. And he had me do it in the morning and I would make this video, 30, 40 minutes, and then send it to him. He'd give me feedback. I'd make it again at lunch. He'd give me feedback and make it again in the evening. And so two to three times a day, every day, I would make this video. And in that process, I took his feedback and I got better. Now this wasn't making a one minute quick video. It was 30 minutes each time. It was a lot of work to put together, but I was committed to achieving that goal of being a better speaker. And with the guidance he gave me, I grew quickly. And I must have made that video 30, 40 times overall before I had a final version that he actually kind of liked. I quickly went from being the worst at the agency, almost not getting in, not being a good enough speaker, to being 
one of the best. Two being the one that they started sharing my videos to say, look at what Evan's doing. You should be doing it like he's doing it. I became the best practice case from being the worst in only a couple of months. I went from the worst to among the best in a couple of months. And it's not because I have a natural skill or gift or talent. If you look back on my old YouTube videos, you can see that I was very nervous and very awkward and the videos were terrible. And it's just because I worked hard because I was making three videos a day to practice and hone my skills where everybody else at the agency had a hard time finding time to do one video a week. And so if somebody's doing three a day and somebody else is doing one a week, even if this person is way ahead of them, this person's gonna catch up really quickly. And so you could take that same approach in your business. There may be people who are way ahead of you, who have decades of experience sometimes, but they've grown slow, they've grown lazy, the world is changing, and you can quickly pick up on the new trends and just by hustling harder, when they're doing one thing a week, you're doing it three times a day, you will catch up to them and you will pass them at a lightning pace because you are just hustling harder than they are. And so yes, you have to work smart, and yes, you have to be conscious of where you're spending your time, and you have to hustle, and you have to work hard. And that applies to your business, that applies to your life, that applies to your relationships, whether you're a husband, wife, father, mother, it applies to every area of your life. Where you are spending your time and dedicating yourself to become excellent, that's when excellent things start to happen. Now I have a special bonus clip for you that I think you're really gonna enjoy, but before getting to that, my question of the day is, what is the area in your life or your business that you really wanna double down and hustle harder at to become one of the best in the world at? Leave it down in the comments below. I'm really curious to find out. Thank you guys so much for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is. Much love, enjoy the bonus clip, and I'll see you again tomorrow morning for another shot of Espresso. I was from Harlem and I had moved to Mount Vernon when I was like 12. I didn't really know anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that I wanted to start thinking about what I was going to do with my life. And, um, At 12 years old? Yeah, 12. Yeah, so, you know, I started delivering papers and I had a paper route and um, started delivering multiple papers. I wasn't supposed to have a paper route, but I made a deal with the, you know, some of the paper boys in the neighborhood that were going to college. Let me deliver your papers and I'll send y'all half the money. So they was with that, and that's really how I started to get my hustle on. And just like I ran to get the tape, I would make sure that I put the paper inside the door so the older ladies wouldn't have to come out their house in the cold. So it was always about doing like the best and the greatest job I could do. Um, living in Mount Vernon, there was just one king of Mount Vernon. It was one guy that made it out of Mount Vernon, and mm -hmm. it, was, it was Heavy D. Mm -hmm. So I had all my heroes and stuff from Harlem when I moved to Mount Vernon, and then you know, I, I saw my first rap star and I, I could, you know, he lived in the area. You know, I was so consumed with rap and I was just so in love with it. And then Heavy D, Heavy D was just so fly, like, and he was a big guy, he was dancing and he was like, he was like almost like the flyest that came out of hip hop. Not just because he was a big guy and fly, he was just straight fly. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? From his haircuts to the suits to with Teddy Riley combining R&B and hip hop. So he was just like a guy that I was like, I gotta meet this guy. You know, I, I would wait around the pizza shop that he would come to. I would just sit outside the pizza shop. And one day he came in the pizza shop and I, you know, I said to him, um, you know, I wanna talk to you about being your manager. Like, <laughs> like I, went, I went all the way with it. I was How like, old you know, were you when you said this? This is like when I was like 17, you know. And so, um, I'm like, I wanna be your manager. You know, I'm not really knowing the game. I'm not really caring if you had a manager. I'm like, you know, ain't nothing but air and opportunity. I might as well go for the gusto. And then he like kinda like laughed at me. He was like, you crazy, you know what I'm saying? He bought me a slice of pizza. And I was telling him, you know, I really wanna be in the music industry, you know. Um, and you know, I'm interning now with WBLS, that was the radio station, but I really, really, really want to get down with you in Uptown. And then I said, you know, you know, maybe you could get me a meeting with Andre Harrell. And um, he was just like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. And he was just like, you know, you're, you're a different type of guy. Like, I like your hustle and the way you're coming at me. And um, he said, let me see what I could do. How many months did he take to do that? It took like maybe eight months of like persistence. I used to, I remember I went from stalking him at the pizza shop to like, there was like a fork in the road. 
to like where like he would have to veer off to the left to go to his house, but then it was like in a kind of a main street. So I used to just walk up and down that block to hope to, to see his car to be like, hey, hey, what's up, Hep? Like I was on the block. You know what I'm saying? I had no problem with playing myself. Right, right, right. You know, I had no problem with any of that. I just had my eye was on the prize, and I was excited to see him. I was excited to be chasing my dream, to be walking up and down the sidewalk, you know, just, just making sure he didn't get embarrassed a little bit, and the time it just perfectly. And he drove past me like three times. I never caught him there, mm -hmm. but I got, a, I got enough heart one day. I said, I'm just gonna walk up to his house. Like, I, I need, this how bad I need this. I'm gonna walk up to his house. And I was like, now you can't ring the doorbell. And then I would just, I just made sure that I would, I would walk by his house. And one day he was outside. And I said, you know, I, I really need you to, you know, make this call for me. And then, you know, he, you know, he had the cell phone. And I guess, you know, it was kind of big and everything. And he pulled it out, he made the call. And he set up, he set up a meeting for me to meet with you. Mm -hmm. As a kid, when you were starting out, like I know, you know, they had a lemonade stand. Did you start off having a business used, as a kid? I used to cut grass, man. I used to push my lawnmower around the hood, you know, 10, 11 years old, asking the old ladies, can I cut their grass? You know, it went from that to me standing on the corner by the house. But they still was cool with me, though. That's amazing. They come out, you know, give me food Sunday, you know what I mean? I come eat with them, go back on the block. I never told nobody this is something that we do in Georgia. Like during the summer as kids, we used to go throw watermelons with our our elders. I used to throw watermelons with my uncle. You get bit by snakes or anything, but you go out in these big ass fields and you throw watermelons and whatever the load is, it might give you $20, $30 for that day. And you've been in the sun all day. At the end of the week, I might have, you know, $100, but $100 in ones with a 20 on top look like a lot. So yeah. I used to just fool all my friends, like, yo, I'm getting money, you know what I mean? And it was like, damn, GZ, like, how the fuck, you know what I mean? Like, we ain't making the money you make, you know what I mean? We getting paid crumbs, but always been a natural born hustler. So I'm gonna go hard no matter what because I gotta feed my family. Yeah. Exactly. And I gotta feed myself. And I'm and I and if you notice on my snap, I'm trying to make it super clear. When I get something to eat, it costs money to eat. Okay. Like you gotta pay the bill. Like if it's a cheeseburger, it's five dollars, mm. it's five dollars. If it's a filet mignon, it's thirty-five dollars. You know, God forbid you want a lobster. Right. It's forty-five. <laughs> like, and this is food. Guess what? And I try to tell the young girl, I don't know why they're not telling them. Yeah. It costs money there to eat. Go. Right, right. So guess Let's what know. you got to do? You got to get money. Yeah. See, you know, it makes me mad that people try to discourage people from getting money. Like, it's yeah. a problem. <laughs> I didn't create the system. Right, right, right. Like, <laughs> like I mean, if it was free, I would thank you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then, so what I'm trying to say is we have to hustle. We have to get money. Like, you know, cheat, teach the young world. Work hard. Strive hard. It's okay. Um, I remember when I was young, they told me, Khaled, you, you, you're only going to get a Hyundai. So I went and bought a Phantom. Oh, you know what I'm man. saying? Like, so you know what I'm trying to tell you? Like, that's what I'm saying. If you want to wear a dope sneaker, what's wrong with wearing a dope sneaker? It would cost money. Okay. Right. Great. Work hard. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the problem? But they the don't problem? want us to wear dope sneakers. Nah, they, they don't. Do. That's the, and that's the, that's the major key. <laughs> they don't want us to. Mm -hmm. So I'm letting you know straight up. They don't want Big Boy to have the number one morning show in the country. Oh, hey. God damn it. You know what I'm saying? But guess what? We got the number one show in the country. Exactly.